if you know enough population genetics and evolution and modeling and quantitative science that you can read the history of an organism as it's written in the genome. And so today I'm going to tell you about two different projects that I have worked on where we've been able to do that. We look at the genetic diversity in populations, and then we use that to make inference about what has happened in the past and how organisms are reshaped. All right, so uh, I'm an evolutionary geneticist, and the exact topic that I focus on is called genetic novelty. How do you get brand new gene sequences where there weren't any genes before? And then how do evolutionary forces act on that diversity of new gene sequences to produce evolutionary change? And a lot of what my lab works on is spent on exactly these types of mutations. Things like duplications, deletions, and chromosomal rearrangements, and selfish genes, transposable elements, how they move sections of DNA around the genome. And it turns out that these types of mutations that copy and shuffle pieces of DNA and move them around the genome are really, really good at creating brand new gene sequences where there weren't any genes before. So it's pretty easy to get mutations that change one letter of the DNA, but most of the time just changing one base pair isn't going to get you a new gene. Maybe you get really lucky and it does, but these mutations that take a piece of DNA that's already in the genome and they copy them and they put them someplace else are really good at creating brand new genes. So if you copy a piece of DNA that has a whole gene sequence and you put a second copy in the genome, you can create <laughs> whole gene duplications that copy the transcription start site, the transcription stop site, they've got the promoter, they've got most of the regulatory stuff, and they form complete proteins. So then you have two copies of gene sequences where you used to just have one. And this gives you spare parts that if you mutate one of the copies, the other copy can still continue to do what it always did, which presumably is something that the organism needs, and that's why that gene exists. So then you can mutate this other copy and change it and tweak it to produce innovation that does something cool and new and different because you have these spare parts. And this is one really important source of how you get new genes that's been studied for um, you know, more, than, more than 60 years in the past. You can also now we know take pieces of genes. Your duplications appear in the DNA and they're just random mutations and they don't know ahead of time where the boundaries of the genes are. So you can copy pieces of genes and stick them together. And so you can mix and match the five prime end and the three prime end of a gene to create what are called chimeras. And these are more different from the things that they were created from than your whole gene duplications. It's not just a copy of a gene that does the same thing as, as what it always did. This is a piece of a gene and a piece of another gene and you mix and match them and you stick them together and you're more likely to get something really weird and different. Most of the time those things are gonna be useless or perhaps even bad, but every once in a while they can produce evolutionary innovation that's beneficial. You can also take a gene and you can pick it up and move it to a new genomic location. So you can move it from chromosome two over to chromosome four. And so this is oftentimes associated with changes in gene expression. And those mutations are often associated with selfish genes called transposable elements that copy themselves, whether it's good for the host or not. And they're a force that can mix and match pieces of genes all over the genome. You can also form retrogenes, which is when you get a retrotransposable element that copies itself through a, an RNA intermediate, and it latches on to an mRNA for a gene sequence to create a new copy of that gene, and it plunks it down someplace else in the genome, and you see a copy that is missing some of the introns or perhaps all of the introns because it's made from a spliced mRNA. So this will also give you a new copy of a gene that has different introns, and it's in a different location, and those are also frequently associated with changes in gene expression. Or you can mix and match pieces of genes by deleting sequences, and that will modify proteins as well. So we study these different types of mutations that change larger sections of DNA at once, and the ways that they can create new evolutionary innovation. And then we go look at genomic sequence data for natural populations to see how common or how rare 
different mutations are. Because if a mutation is favored by natural selection, it should spread through the population and become more common. So by understanding which types of these mutations are associated with signatures of natural selection, causing them to spread through populations, and the ones that are not, we can then get some sort of picture about what types of mutations do good things and what types of mutations do bad things. And we hypothesize that these mutations are what are called hopeful monsters within the genome. There's this old idea from evolution, from looking at phenotypes and looking at organisms as a whole, that you have a mutation that looks really bad in one environment, but it may be really good in a different environment. And so if you have variation that looks like it could even be bad, then you throw it into a new environment that it can be part of the substrate that facilitates evolutionary change. The idea is you take a walrus and you stick it in the middle of the Sahara Desert, it's not gonna be very fit to that environment. But if you go throw that thing in the ocean, then it is a perfect fit for its environment. This is the same concept, but we work on that question at a genetic level instead of with respect to whole organisms. So I've worked on these different types of mutations in lots of different animals over the course of my career. Uh, when I first started working on these mutations in graduate school, it was finally possible to use whole genome sequences for model organisms like Drosophila melanogaster, your standard lab fruit fly, to study how these mutations formed, how common they were, and to search for signatures of selection. But now genome sequencing has improved drastically, and the same type of sequencing that is used for personalized genomic medicine or for those ancestry kits that look at your DNA and try to figure out where your ancestors came from. That type of analysis is now possible in almost any organism that you choose. So as genome sequencing has gotten better and better, I've been able to work on these same mutations in non-model Drosophila called Drosophila yacuba, which come from Central Africa. I've been able to work on these mutations in ancient DNA for Neanderthals and for woolly mammoths. I worked on these dreadful poison dart frogs whose genomes are so repetitive that it's hard to put the jigsaw puzzle together, and we wrote a paper on that. Um, and then back when I was an undergraduate, I worked on these types of mutations in plant genomes, like this dodecaploid strawberry that has 12 copies of every chromosome. But across each of these different organisms, the genetic questions remain the same, and that's what's going on with our sources of genetic novelty and how do they reshape genomes over time. So by comparing outcomes from different animals, we can start to figure out which rules seem to be true no matter what organism we look at and maybe part of the rules of life. And then which types of outcomes seem to be the product of the unique biology and evolutionary history of the organism. So sometimes we see the same types of outcomes in fruit flies and even in humans and in plants. And that's that new genes are often associated with a promoter, with an on-off switch that turns them on in the testes. And there seems to be a very clear relationship between male reproduction across the tree of life and new gene formation, probably because of coevolutionary processes where the males and the females are trying to interact with one another and they're constantly changing to get the upper hand. But in other cases, we see very unique outcomes like with our frogs that seem to be special for that one organism. And then we can try to figure out what it is about that animal that makes this outcome possible that's different from the others. But one of the best arguments, I think, for why we need a multi-organism approach and why it's really beneficial to have the same lab working on lots of different types of animals comes from the field of population genetics and especially population genetic theory. There are really well worked out theories on pencil and paper uh, with mathematical models that suggest that the amount of diversity in a population should depend on what's called the effective population size. So in animals that have very, very large population sizes, like fruit flies or like this freshwater mussel at the top that has millions and millions of individuals just in one reservoir and is common all over the southeastern United States, that you should see very high genetic diversity. And it's governed by this equation, theta is equal to 4 times Ne times mu, the mutation rate. 
So four times the effective population size times the mutation rate governs how much genetic diversity you should see in a population. And there's a whole field called coalescent theory that you can learn about if you want to that describes how these mathematical models are developed. In small populations, though, for animals that are threatened or endangered or even extinct, then we should see a lot less genetic diversity because four times the effective population size times the mutation rate is much smaller. I have a lot fewer woolly mammoths right now than I do fruit flies. Fruit flies are in no danger of going extinct at all. But if you compare that to the genetic diversity that you see for endangered species like woolly mammoths or this freshwater mussel that hasn't been seen in the wild since 2008, then you should expect that there will be big differences in the genetic diversity. And that actually has been borne out in the new genetic data that people have been able to collect for different animals. So this is the amount of standing genetic variation that is present right now today. If you go out into a population and you can count up all the individuals, this is the amount of diversity that you would expect to see. So I have more genetic diversity in a large population than in a small population. So if that population gets hit with a big change in its environment, like we expect for our hopeful monster model, then there are more individuals and there's more genetic diversity in that population if it's really big. And so you have greater chances that there's some mutation that's present in the population that will help you survive and adapt to that changing environment compared to in a small population. You have fewer individuals that can survive, but even for those individuals, you have less genetic diversity. And so the chance that you have your beneficial mutation that you need to survive in this environment that it's present right now is fairly low if you've got a small population size. So this means that we should see differences in how organisms adapt to changing environments in these small populations, which is especially relevant now today in what's called the anthropogenic era where humans have wrecked the environment for uh, so many other species around them. If I don't have a mutation right now today available in my population, then I have to rely on new mutations in order to generate the variation that I need to survive changing environments. There are models for that too, and these are actually much more complex to derive. Um, but they depend on, again, the effective population size, the mutation rate, and then the selection coefficient for that mutation. So how beneficial and how detrimental is it? And it's one over four any mu s. So if I have a big population size, I have to wait less time to get a new mutation that's beneficial compared to in, I'm trying to get the chat up here, compared to what I see in a small population. Sorry, I, my mouse disappears on this. Yes, please interrupt me and ask questions. If you can turn on your microphone, that will be way more helpful because <laughs> I'm having trouble with the chat. Yep, yep it's on. Great. So feel free to ask any questions as you go. Yes, ahead. please interrupt, because like, um, um, I, I haven't met you guys before, so I'm not totally clear on your background. I know that you are all pros enough in biology that you have aced your exams and gotten to USAPO. But please, if you have questions or you're curious, let me know. Oh, we have one question. Um, could you explain again what the uh, T subscript E was um, trying to uh, solve for? So the effective population size. So if I go out and I count my individuals, that's called the census population size. The effective population size, and we'll touch on this just a little bit later, is fitting the mathematical models. Not every individual in the population will reproduce. If you have separate males and females, then you get differences in, in how those count towards your model. And so the effective population size is the, the number co that comes out of the mathematical models. A lot of times it should correlate with the census sizes, but it won't be exactly the same. So any for fruit flies is about 10 to the sixth. Really, we have a kajillion fruit flies in the world, but their effective population size is only a million. And mu is the mutation rate and S is the selection coefficient. So you should have shorter times that you need when you have a larger population size in order to generate new mutations and start them to spread in natural populations. You have more individuals, so it's like buying more lottery tickets, 
those individuals then also are in a large population. So there's less influence from genetic drift, just from chance variation. Imagine you have the best woolly mammoth ever, but it got hit by lightning. Then that's not going to spread through the population just because of chance, not because it was unfit. So there's this decoupling. Whereas if you've got a 1% frequency mutation in a fruit fly, really that means there's lots and lots and lots of fruit flies that actually have that mutation. And so you don't just have one and you're less likely to use it, lose it by chance. Um, and the fluctuations in allele frequencies will be less drastic. So we expect the substrate that's available right now today to be different in a large population compared to a small population. And then we also expect to see these differences in the amount of time to get adaptation to new mutations. And if you're talking about deep evolutionary time, will some animals somewhere sometime adapt to this change? Sure, we see that over and over. It's pretty likely that there's gonna be some sort of bacterium that can survive this change. But can we survive this change or can this specific species survive this change? A lot of that is dependent on the mutations that are present right now, especially when environments change quickly. Like again, with humans, we have changed the environment more quickly than you have seen in the past for any ancient era. And so how quickly these organisms can adapt depends on population genetic models. We also know that what's called the nearly neutral threshold changes in large and small populations. If four times the effective population size times the selection coefficient in a species for a different mutation, if that number is greater than one, then it's like natural selection can see that mutation in the population. If that number is less than one, then the effects are so small that genetic drift, those stochastic fluctuations in populations, just because of incomplete sampling, those will be big enough that they will overwhelm the selective pressures. And you're more likely to get it to behave in the population where it bounces around instead of spreading through the population because it's beneath the nearly neutral threshold. So things that are less than one act like drift, things that are greater than one act like selection. So if I hold my selective pressure constant, if S is a constant and I change in E, I can shift whether in a large population, the specific mutation that's present right now, whether that is above or below the neutral threshold. So we expect some things in our small populations like our endangered species, to lie beneath the nearly neutral threshold just because the population sizes are small. You've got a small gene pool, more chance variation. And so it's more likely that th this thing will be lost, even if it's beneficial. If you're in a large population, it's more likely that these mutations lie above the nearly neutral threshold and that natural selection can see them. So bad mutations get weeded out, good mutations will spread. So we should see different results in things like our fruit flies or our freshwater mussels that are very common compared to what happens in our endangered species um, that we look at their gene when we look at their genomes. So this is the theoretical model that says if I go out into natural populations, I should see different things in different animals. And these are really well worked out for, for single base pair changes where we know a lot about their mutation rates. We know that they appear in populations at clock-like rates. You get a certain number of mutations every generation, and you have a little bit of variation in how many mutations per generation, but overall, there's not much fluctuation. With our sources of genetic novelty, though, the duplications and deletions and rearrangements, they have very different mutation rates, and they have very different selection coefficients in populations. They're more likely to be either beneficial or detrimental compared to what we see as single letter changes, and they're less likely to be neutral. But they also sometimes appear in bursts, especially if they're associated with these selfish genes called transposons. So transposable elements can be nice and quiet for a long, long time, and then they can activate and create a, a, a whole bunch of copies in the genome all at once in a single variation. So you'll have these boom and bust dynamics. So to study those mutations, we think that you need an empirical approach. That means you look at actual data from real world populations instead of just mathematical theories in order to understand how they reshape genomes and reshape evolutionary processes. 
So today I'm going to tell you about um, one project that I, I've done in my lab to create new genetic resources for freshwater mussels, where we're trying to um, answer exactly these types of evolutionary questions about how evolution works in large and small populations when you get big shifts in your environment. And we'll also be talking about a project that I did in woolly mammoths, assuming we have time. All right, so um, I grew up in a town called Florence, Alabama. It's on the banks of the Tennessee River. And Florence, Alabama is famous for two things. One is uh, a recording studio that was at Muscle Shoals called Fame Recording Studio. So the Rolling Stones and Bob Dylan and a bunch of other people, um, the Black Keys, Alicia Keys, all the Keys have recorded at that, at that music studio in the past. The other thing that it's famous for, believe it or not, is that it's a hotbed of species diversity for freshwater mussels. So these are freshwater bivalves, um, like clams, mussels, scallops. So the mussels, uh, there are historically over 80 different species of freshwater mussels that were found right here in Florence, Alabama, in this one stretch of the river. Um, so people who do freshwater ecology know this location because it's one of the most diverse locations for freshwater mussels in the entire world. So all of my high school science fair projects, my ISEP projects um, that I did were on freshwater mussels because that was one of the things that we had in our town for science. All right, so there's been some changes though to this environment that have resulted in a huge drop in the species diversity in this exact location. And now about half of the original species diversity remains. One of those changes is that they put in a dam on the river in 1918. And as early as 1924, natural historians that were visiting that part of the country, it was, again, famous. People who collected freshwater mussel shells and did natural history and then shipped them back to Europe, they would go to Mussel Shoals, Alabama to look at all the different species that were there. By 1924, after the dam was finished, okay. then there was a massive loss of species mm -hmm. diversity. Questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, interrupt me and ask questions because I can't really see the chat with the way Zoom is working on this. Yeah. You need to ask questions. Okay, Michelle. Um, so ever since the um, so ever since the dam river in 1918, have they like government or like have they made any uh, like policies that sort of fix the issues with uh spiritual and bivalve and fish hoods? So can you repeat that last part? Have they made any? Has the local government made any like changes or like policy fixes to um, increase the dispersal by valves and fish hoods since then? Oh, great question. Have there been any interventions like you know how fish ladders work on dams where they they make a channel where the fish can go through? Um, that kind of stuff. So at this location, they have not modified to put in changes that would help the species. In other parts of the state and other parts of the country, they mm -hmm. have put those in. There's a dam that was put in much later in the 1960s, I think, in South Alabama. So it was constructed far later. And by that point, they knew that the dams had big effects on the wildlife, including fish and the mussels. In that location, they didn't put in a fish ladder at first, but they would open and they would leave the locks open, completely open, with the idea that the fish could run through. And there were commercially relevant fish species that would swim up the river from marine locations down in South Alabama at the Gulf. And so in that location, they left the locks open and you can see differences in the biological diversity and now in some new genetic data that we have for that location. And then they're trying to put in more formal fish ladders um, to, to help different species move back and forth more readily so that they don't have to stop using the locks at that point. So those interventions matter a lot. At this location, at that time, they did not do any sort of ecological mitigation. And those, um, those interventions have been really important in maintaining species diversity elsewhere. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, no questions. I'm missing a, okay, it's there. Um, Muscle Shoals is also um, not, it, I found out recently, I always knew it was polluted, but it is the most polluted section of any river in Alabama. So it's the most polluted section on the most polluted river in the state of Alabama, which is really something to brag about. Um, so historically it was sprayed with DDT. In the 19, um, 
before the 1940s, there was Vivax malaria, the less harmful version of mal malaria that was endemic to the region. And so uh, after World War II, as part of, of Roosevelt's uh, ABC agencies, TVA, the Tennessee Valley Authority, had built this lock and dam. And then they also would spray for mosquitoes. And the mosquito control got rid of Vivax malaria in the region, but it had huge ecological effects. So they handed out DDT to spray outside your house. They sprayed the river with DDT and it decimated wildlife, especially the bald eagle populations. Now with modern environmental regulations and different types of pesticides that they use, some of that is recovering. But there's still a lot of other incidental pollution. It's cotton country, so there's high pesticide use. You can see the crop dusters overhead um, over the weekends. Um, there's a chemical plant nearby. Uh, there's a munitions plant. So TVA put this, this dam along the river for a hydroelectric plant, and they were making nitrates for bombs in World War II. And then there's all this propaganda about how they were helping the cotton farmers because the same chemicals that you can use for munitions are also used as fertilizer. Um, so my dad worked in the fertilizer development division for a long time. There's a chemical plant nearby that moved in. There's also some stuff that like I don't have a citation for, but there's like this radioactive slag pile where there's like radium infused slate just in a pile. And then high school kids would dare each other to jump the fence and the TVA would police were trying to get them out of there. Or this place where there's um, red phosphorus where if you hit it, it explodes. And again, they're trying to get the high school kids out of there before somebody loses a limb. There's a, a chemical plant, a paper mill, and some other industry just upstream now. Re recently, Monsanto has moved in, and there's lots of chemical discharge for that. So between these issues of the dam being put in place and all the chemical pollution, only 40 of the 80 species remain, and many of those species are now threatened or endangered. So there's been this massive ecological change in this region with high biological diversity for these unique freshwater mussels. So these mussels are actually going extinct elsewhere across the US. Um, as, as this article so eloquently put it, that sucks. These are filter feeders. They're the basis of ecological food chains. Um, they keep the algae under control. If they go missing, there are big changes in the rivers in, that have effects on lots of other uh, wildlife. So they're a keystone species for freshwater ecology. Um, and, and that's bad news, including for humans. If they go missing, you can get these horrific algae blooms. This is not mussel shoals, this is someplace else. But freshwater algae blooms, when they occur, they also cause changes in the oxygen content. They can produce some toxins. So they're associated with massive fish die-offs that wreak to high heaven. You can't go swimming when this happens. And so you want to keep your freshwater mussels in the population if you can, whether you've ever noticed them in the past or not. They're one of the things that keep your rivers um, clean enough to actually swim in. These freshwater mussels are strange in a lot of different ways. They're known uh, because of their unusual life cycle. So as adults, they are benthic filter feeders. They settle down into the muck at the bottom of the river and they filter water through their gills and they take algae out of the water column and digest that for their food. In most of these species, you have separate male and female sexes, so they are dioecious. The males release sperm into the water column, and the females are fertilized internally. So the females have their offspring, and they, they store their offspring in their gills. They're fertilized internally. They store their offspring in their gills, and when they're gravid, which is like being pregnant for a freshwater mussel, they can have a single female about the size of my hand can easily have a million offspring in a single season. These offspring, when they're mature enough, will be released into the water column where they attach to the gills and the fins of different fish hosts. And in their larval stage, they parasitize the fish. It was a debate for a while whether they just hitched a ride on the fish to go downstream or if they actually parasitize the fish. Everything we know now says that they parasitize the fish. So they attach to fish hosts. And so then instead of being herbivorous, they're carnivorous. They're fishing, on, they're eating on the fish blood. Eventually they mature enough that they drop off the fish hosts and settle down into the substrate to become these benthic filter feeding adults again. So we have this interaction between the sexes. We have parental care in an invertebrate species. We have this transition 
from herbivory to carnivory over their life cycle. We have co-evolutionary processes between the parasites and the host fish. And then on top of that, they have this bizarre mitochondrial inheritance pattern um, where the males inherit their mitochondria from the paternal line, from the males, the father, and the females inherit their mitochondria from the maternal lineage. So most other organisms get their mitochondria from the maternal line only. But these freshwater mussels are really weird, and the males get their mitochondria from their fathers. There's some debate about whether the mitochondria are responsible for sex determination or if that has some other genetic component. But this is extremely weird. So there's lots of rapid evolution. And if you could get genome sequences to study the genetic basis of that, there's probably lots of interesting biology to look at. A lot of species interact with their fish hosts by luring them in. So they produce these little lures. This is a mantle flap, that thing that looks like a, minto, a minnow. It's actually a piece of the mantle. The outside, you know, if you get oysters, that will be the outside flaps that enclose them. So the mantle of the oyster has been, of, of the mussel has been modified for some species. And so it has this little minnow-like thing and it can flick it and it goes fishing. And then a fish, big fish comes along, tries to eat the minnow. And when it gets there, and instead of getting a meal, it actually gets a mouthful of, of parasites where the female will release the offspring into the water. So the females will have these lures and the males won't. Other species release their um, offspring in these little packets that have been modified to look like tiny fish. So it has these markings on the packet. This is really a mass of glycidia, a mass of offspring that are parasitic, that are going to infect a fish. And it's been modified to look like a little fish with two eyes and a mouse. So it's managed to have these changes to interact with the fish. Others are generalists and they just release tons of offspring into the water column with a whole bunch of snot. So they release them in mu mucus nets and they produce so many of them that the hope is when a fish swims by, they can just release so many offspring that they infect them. And this is a gravid female. The gills here are actually puffy because they have so many offspring inside. And again, a single female, about as big as your hand, which is pretty common for these to get that size, can hold a million offspring every single season. And they can live for up to close to 60 years. The average age is probably about 30, um, but they, they can live for a really long time. So they can produce tons and tons of offspring over their life cycle. There's lots of attrition. There's a low chance it'll attach to a fish host. So there's big selection there to attach to the fish, um, but we, we have this unusual biology. All right, so there are some species, including just at mussel shoals, that are doing just fine. So Megalonius nervosa, one of the species I worked on for my ISEF projects, uh, the washboard mussel, is doing fine. It has tens of millions of individuals just in, in the one reservoir back home, and it's found all over the eastern United States. It is not in danger of going extinct. It's doing about as well as a fruit fly. But then we have other species that haven't been seen in the wild for decades, and they may be completely gone, and others still that are still around, but the populations are struggling. So this seems like a good situation to test those evolutionary theories. We have within a single clade, within a, a single set of species, at a single location with a common environment, massive changes to that environment, coupled with differences in the population sizes. And so we can start to test our theories by looking at genome sequences from these different organisms. Yeah, so when I got my, my lab, um, they give you, when you start as a professor, a set of money that you can use to start projects and do a little bit of science in your lab while you're trying to convince the funding agencies to let you continue your work. The nice thing about the startup funding is that you can spend it on any crazy thing that you come up with. You probably want to have some sure bets. We've got our fruit fly projects for that. But I decided it was time since no one else had made reference genomes yet for these species. There were no genome sequences available at all. Everyone who wanted to do genetics didn't have money every, and, and cared about these freshwater mussels. They didn't have money. The people who had money didn't care about freshwater mussels. And then I came along and nerded out 
and gut genome sequences for freshwater mussels. So if you could only start with one species at the beginning, I decided to start with this one because it is one of the success stories in freshwater mussels. This is one of the species that's doing just fine. So if you want a baseline for how organisms adapt to changing environments, this seems like a good place to begin. So the washboard mussel is, is successful. The populations have actually expanded instead of contracting. It likes the muddy waters that appeared after the dam and is more comfortable in those than in the fresh than in the whitewater rapids that used to be there. They have been surveyed by the Tennessee Valley Authority for decades. So since TVA came in, it monitored freshwater mussel populations as an indicator of water quality. Why? Because if those things drop dead, you have probably polluted the place too much and you need to evacuate the humans. So they have good records uh, at, at regular intervals every few years about the freshwater mussel populations. And in the latest census, there were 80 million individuals just in that one reservoir. They're also, they used to be of commercial um, importance. They were used to make freshwater pearls and they would take their shells and punch out um, uh, buttons, little buttons. So if you have pearl buttons on someone's shirt, then they would often be made from these types of species. And so it's, again, one of the success stories. All right, so I contacted, when I got my professor gig, I contacted Jeff Garner, who I'd worked with in high school on my ISF projects, him and Tom Haggerty, who was at the University of North Alabama. Tom's retired now. So I got in touch with Jeff. He does the surveys for the state of Alabama um, for freshwater conservation. So he's out in all the rivers uh, across the state. This is him in his natural habitat doing his scuba diving. He does the hands-on research on those populations um, and, and is one of the world's experts on the diversity of freshwater mussels. So he can look at a shell and tell you which species it is and where it came from. And if you want to identify your species, he's got this beautiful book. I actually have it right here today. Luckily enough, it's huge and it's got photographs and, and information about every species in the state, about like where they live, what the shells look like, what the actual mussels inside look like, um, and information about how they re reproduce, how they interact with their fish hosts, and all the information you could have. So he and Art Bogan, who's over at the North Carolina State Natural History Museum, they are two of the world's experts in species diversity. So he collected freshwater mussels for us, and he sent them to us with FedEx, which is a whole other adventure, calling FedEx to say, hey, how do I need to pack these things so you don't throw them away? And he sent them to us, and then we did what we do. We threw them into a blender. We chopped them up. We threw them into a blender. We got DNA out of them, and we got RNA out of them. When I started this project, I thought it would be simple. I designed my experiment so if this were human DNA or a mouse or a fruit fly, that we would walk out with an absolutely perfect genome. But when we did this, it turns out it's pretty hard to get long DNA molecules out of freshwater mussels, and we still don't know why. We don't know if it's all the mucus that they produce that's clogging our DNA preps. We don't know if there's modifications to their DNA that's causing changes, but it was relatively hard to get good sequence data especially for long read sequencing to put this genome together. So we had a little bit of a Humpty Dumpty problem, but we think we have a pretty good assessment of the genes in the genome. Um, so our genome is well put together for gene content, but we're missing some of the repetitive elements. If you have those selfish genes that copy themselves, which are a large part of the genome, then the genome is broken up there because you can't put together the jigsaw puzzle. It's too complicated. It's like working in a jigsaw one puzzle. Question. Sure. All right, go ahead. Um, what sequencing methods did you guys use to sequence your DNA? Was it like uh, next-gen sequencing or what? Yes. So with next-gen sequencing, it's cost-effective um, to get genomes for any organism at all. So we use the combination approach of Illumina short read sequencing, which is still the most common type of sequencing. And then we used PacBio and Nanopore sequencing to get the long reads to help... Um, span the repeats. So um, we we first tried one type of long read sequencing that can get you, so Illumina can get you 300 to 500 base pairs at a time. The long read sequencing is advertised to get you at least 20 to 30,000 base pairs at a time. When we did our freshwater mussels, the, the molecular profile says that we've got long DNA molecules. 
that are like 20 to 30,000 base pairs long. And then the reads we got back were 2,000 to 5,000 base pairs long with PacBio. With nanopore, we could get longer molecules, and we're still not totally sure why. We're not sure if some of the DNA is methylated and wound up and tangled up around other proteins, and so the reads can't get through as easily with the PacBio, or if the DNA is modified or damaged in some way so that the PacBio polymerase falls off, but nanopore can still get it. So I don't know how much you know about those sequencing technologies, um, but, but the nanopore worked much better for us, and that's what we're doing now which is a bit unusual. Most other animals, fruit flies, mice, humans, you are absolutely fine using anything you want and you get much better results. With these marine organisms, for some reason, the mollusks, they haven't worked well for us or for anyone else in the field. Perfect. Thank you. Yep. So we got, we got DNA sequencing and RNA sequencing that helps us mark the genes. And so we could get a genome, we could annotate the genes, um, the QC stuff tells us that we are getting most of the genes and we're missing some of the repeats. So our genome is still in pieces, but we can look at what the genes are and how they work and get a pretty decent con uh, you know, picture of gene content. So when we first got this genome, I thought at first we would do maybe just a resource release, that we would release the reference genome that we have made so that the community could have it. Because at that point, there was, only, there was one other lab that started doing a, a pretty poor genome sequence, you know, not their fault, just the technology at the time they started um, a, a pretty bad genome sequence for one other species, but there were no other species that had genomes when we started. So we started writing up that paper, but there were, um, so I work on sources of genetic novelty and duplicate genes, and I said, well, before we send this paper out, I'm just going to take a quick peek at the gene duplications. So you can, in a single genome, look at the ages of different duplicate genes and when they formed. If a gene got copied yesterday, the two copies of that gene should look almost identical, with almost no mutations separating them from one another. If that gene duplication appeared long in the past, it got copied and then it got inherited one generation after the other and new single base pair changes, new single letter changes to the DNA will accumulate over time. And so we can use what's called the molecular clock to come up with how long ago these duplicate genes appeared. So this is a graph of what you get and it's similar to what you would get from most genomes if you compare the copies of every duplicate gene to every other duplicate gene in the genome. There's lots of things that appeared really recently that are very young. And then it drops off stochastically. And there are relatively few things that are very old. You can fit birth death models, similar to models of how radioactive decay occurs, to get a picture of how often these things form and how quickly they are eliminated from the genome. And this is fairly standard for a lot of reference genome sequences. So we can fit our birth death models. And when we do, we get a mutation rate of roughly 10 to the minus eight per gene per generation. And that's just spot on with what we would expect if we were doing the same type of analysis on a mammal like humans. So that's nice and it's cute, but as we did, this, um, it gave us one other data point to share with the world about how often genes get copied in, the, in this particular species. But there was something that popped out of the analysis as we were doing it that was a surprise, especially to me, and I've worked in this field for so long. There were some gene families that had lots and lots of copies. We did this analysis completely blind to what the gene function was. We just have genes, we compare the copies to one another, we write the code, it's all done in an automated fashion. But there was one gene family that had 143 different gene family members. And it turns out that this is the cytochrome P450 detox gene family. We have so many members of this gene family that we can spit separate birth death models to that gene family and show that they are significantly different from the genome-wide background. So the dashed line here is what you would expect based on this graph that has the genome-wide background model, that 10 to the minus eighth. It looks like there is a significant difference between what's going on with the evolutionary dynamics for this gene family compared to what we would expect based on the genome as a whole. 
So either this gene family specifically has different mutational dynamics where it's easier to get copies, or natural selection is causing these things to stay in the genome longer than we would expect, which gives us a bigger effective mutation rate. It comes out as looking like mutation, but really it's a combination of mutation and selection. So these cytochrome P450 gene family members have been amplified like crazy. We have 143 different members. We can also then look at how many amino acid substitutions we see compared to what we would expect for the mutation rate and the amount of time it's been based on the non-amino acid changing mutations. And when we do, we see lots of copies with what's called DN over DS greater than one, which is a signature of natural selection. So we think there's been rapid selection on this gene family. Cytochrome P450 genes are responsible for um, drug and toxin resistance in humans and in mice, in, uh, in poison re resistance. So if you have a, a rat or a mouse that's resistant to rat poison, they often have amplified cytochrome P450 genes. It's associated with pesticide resistance in fruit flies and even herbicide resistance in morning glories. And again, this is the most polluted stretch of any river in Alabama. And that fits with what we know about the environment. But we found this thing computationally without knowing what they were. And after the fact, we look, and that does make sense with what we know about their environment. We can repeat this analysis then, to not be biased, on all the large gene families. Anything that had enough copies of genes that was not a transposable element, anything that, that had enough gene family members, enough copies that we could do this analysis, and we pull out the ones that have significant differences from what we expect based on the genome-wide background. When we do, we come up with functions that match with what we know about the organism, even though we did this with you know, completely agnostic to function. We have these mitochondrial management proteins that's intriguing given the dual uniparental inheritance of mitochondria. We have these anticoagulant proteins that we think are um, important for their parasitization of the fish hosts. We have these heat shock and stress tolerance genes, which certainly fits with a lot of their environmental changes. The cytochromes, their interacting partners, the ABC transporters, and then chitin genes, which are part of shell formation in these bivalves. And then we also come, sorry, my arrows are misbehaving. We also have opsins. So at first I didn't know what to think about this, but I've done some work on some other genomes and they have opsins that are amplified too. I called Jeff Garner, the guy who spends all of his time in the water and knows these things, you know, like they're friends of his. I said, Jeff, I've got a crazy question for you. These freshwater mussels, they don't have eyes, right? Like scallops will have eyes. These guys do not. They have no eyes. They don't know how they would sense light or anything. I said, can these things see or do they interact with light? Like if you go down in the water when it's dark or cloudy and you shine a flashlight on them, like do they react? And Jeff started sputtering. And I was like, okay, look, if I'm going too far, you have to tell me because I don't want to, you know, just read the genomes and take that too seriously and, and say something completely bonkers about these guys. And he says, no, I have been talking to Tom Haggerty for more than 20 years, and we both think that they can see. So apparently, if you have them either in a stream or in a bucket on a clear day, Jeff and Tom and that guy Art Bogan over at the Natural History Museum all independently say, if you put a shadow over where they are, they will clam up and react as if there's a predator there. And I found one scientific study that says that they require light to recognize their fish hosts in some species of freshwater mussels where they've kept them in tanks, they put the fish in. If there's light in the tank where they can see the fish, they react to it differently. These opsins have been amplified like crazy. We don't know if that would be because the water got really cloudy after the dam, but it seems to be more general. And I expect it's something to do with the way that they sense light and potentially sense color. There are these, um, these mantis shrimp that can see so many colors and they're really famous for it. And these guys have like more than twice as many opsins as those. So this is one case where looking at the genomics can get us some information that relates back to the organism. But when we did this analysis, again, we weren't looking for any of these things. We just said, hey, what's that? It pops out of our analysis. 
And then I had to go look up some of the gene functions, like these von Willebrand proteins. I didn't know what they were, but they're anticoagulants. We think that that makes lots of sense, given the fact that they parasitize the fish. So this is how using genome sequences, if you know enough modeling and you know enough analysis and you can make sure your mathematical models are rigorous, you can pull out information from the genome that's directly relevant to how these organisms have adapted. And you can understand the functions that are important to the freshwater mussels that are so different from us. If we went in with our preconceived notions, I don't think anyone would have picked up on those options, especially. We can look at some transcriptome data, so RNA sequencing data for different species that were publicly available online. There are lots of other species of freshwater mussels that also have lots of detox genes. And Megalonyus nervosa is actually just medium compared to other freshwater mussels. And so this probably is generally important for the fact that they are filter feeders living in now probably very polluted environments. So one of the ways that they have adapted to their environment is by taking their genes and making extra copies of them. And that copy number variation, the fact that they can copy their detox genes or their stress tolerance genes or their opsins over and over again is key to part of how they have adapted and is most likely, you know, most likely relevant to the fact that they have adapted to these rapidly changing environments. Um, I'm going to skip that. All right, so this work shows that these sources of genetic novelty, these gene duplications, are really important for the ways that they have adapted and probably in the ways that they have adapted to very recent changes. So if you didn't look at those mutations, like copy and shuffle pieces of DNA and move them around the genome, you would have missed this really important story about the genetic basis of adaptation, and you would have missed information that's relevant to your organism. But because we specialize in these duplicate genes, we can find these stories written in the DNA. And because we do the statistics and modeling and bioinformatics, we can get better information out of our genomes than, um, than other people who, um, you know, Jeff Garner, he spends all his time in the water. He's the world expert on freshwater mussels. He's never gone near a genome in his life. He has his specialty and I have mine. And by working together, we can get more information about these species that are ecologically important, but neglected in terms of their genetics and their science. So that's one of the things my lab has been doing to move this project forward. All right, so part of our questions though are, is this just chance variation? Is this genetic drift? Or is this natural selection? The gold standard for doing tests of natural selection are not just from this analysis of one organism. You can get rough measures of adaptation from one individual from one population with our duplicate gene analysis that we did. But to really nail down natural selection, we need to look at population genetic variation. How rare and how common are these different mutations in the population and how have they been shaped by selection? All right, so if you compare your genome to anyone else sitting in the room next to you, you are your own special snowflake. And so you have some mutations in your genome that no one else in the world would have. And you have combinations of mutations that will be different from other individuals all over the world. There are other mutations that will be very common in a population so that most of the individuals that you sample actually have that mutation worldwide. And so it's less unique to have that mutation in your genome. You have other mutations that are moderate frequency mutations, and, and some of those may be specific to you and your genetic relatives, you know, your family members. Others may be quite common in some populations, but not in others across the globe. And so there are patterns that we expect to observe in terms of how rare and how common um, different types of mutations are in the population. So if we sequence a bunch of individuals, we can look at the genetic diversity that's present and the different frequencies of mutations. And we can fit that with other mathematical models that have been developed, the ones that underlie those things I was talking about at the beginning. If you survey genetic diversity in a natural population, we have this equation. Theta is equal to four times any times mu. We use four times any times mu so often that they gave it another name, theta. 
which is shorthand for this thing. If you see theta in population genetics, it is always four in emu. Somebody tries to publish a paper where they call theta something else. We say, no, pick another name. You've got to pick another variable. This one's taken. So four times the effective population size times the mutation rate. In large populations, we expect to see more genetic diversity than in, large, than in small populations. But there's other things about the genetic diversity. If you have genetic drift, you get stochastic fluctuations in mutation frequencies. So you can start off a population and you can let it run. And if you have a smaller population, the allele frequencies will change from one generation to the next just because of stochastic sampling effects. You just have this chance variation where one mutation became more or less common, not because of natural selection, but just because of chance alone. If you have natural selection acting in a population, mutations will move through the population much more quickly. And so you have a lot of things that are at either high frequency or low frequency. So we expect to see differences in the genetic diversity in the population um, when organisms have large and small population sizes, or even in different parts of the genome where the ancestry comes from a time point when there were bigger or smaller population sizes. But if there's natural selection acting, we should see that genetic diversity gets wiped out because something has spread through the population very, very quickly. But we should also see differences in how rare and how common mutations are. So I can take, oh, that worked well. I can take a slice in time of genetic diversity in my population. And it's, if everything is neutral, if there's no natural selection, I should see a distribution of mutation frequencies that has some things very common, some things are very rare, and some things that have just medium frequency in the population at a given time. So I can sequence all the individuals and I can look at every place in the genome where they differ from one another, and a lot of mutations will be really rare. Some of them will be medium frequency and relatively few will be at low frequency. And there are very clearly developed mathematical models for what those frequencies should look like. If I have natural selection in my population, I should see that the other diversity has been wiped out and most of what I see should be low frequency or high frequency with not much at middle frequencies. So these are the signatures that we look for when we're trying to search for natural selection. We look for reductions. Oh, my animation's working well reductions in population genetic diversity in what we estimate theta to be at that part of the genome. And then we should also see what's called skewed site frequency spectra. That's a fancy way of saying we should see lots of rare or common things and we shouldn't see much of moderate frequency because the moderate frequency alleles get driven out when you get natural selection causing something to spread. So there's a statistic called Tajima's D which is a measure of how rare and how common things are. We look at theta, what it is in the genetic data, the average number of pairwide differences, that gives us reduced diversity. Tajima's D is the, is the composite statistic that shows us how rare or how common mutations are. And it's been normalized to a normal distribution in the theory to have a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. There are some assumptions behind these models. They are very similar to what you would assume for Hardy-Weinberg. We assume that all individuals are, they say bisexual in the old literature. Now we would probably say hermaphroditic, which means that you don't have any separate male or female sexes. You assume that there's no non-random random mating, that every individual in the population is just as likely to mate with every other individual, and there's no mating preference. It assumes that there's no geography at all, so there's no geographic separation. You're not isolated by distance from one another, and everything is what they call panmictic, which means everything mixes in the Greek. It assumes that you have equal population sizes every single generation. So there's no population expansion, no population contraction, no bottlenecks, no sudden ballooning of your population, no sudden population crashes, that there's no natural selection, that selection does not act on these populations, and there's no migrants coming in from anywhere else, no aliens, right? You're not on an island where you're being invaded by things from the mainland that have different allele frequencies. So these are the assumptions. There is no 
population in the world that actually meets these assumptions. So the assumptions are always violated. In humans, we know that individuals are not hermaphroditic, right? So they actually have male and female sexes. In most animals that we know of, there is mating preference, right? That's how you get you know, the sheep and the deer that fight each other for mates and stuff. That's how you get some of that, the sexual selection. Mm -hmm. Geographic separation is common and matters more or less in some individuals. And of course, our population sizes can change over time, especially like how, how humans have uh, expanded to, to conquer the globe, right? And so these freshwater mussels also violate these, these assumptions, but the statistics still captures information. And we can use deviations into GMSD combined with deviations in our genetic diversity to search for signatures of selection and also signatures of other things that can affect these processes. So if you plot genetic diversity for our beloved fruit flies that we work on, some of the first species where you were able to do solid population genetics, you get a mean and a variance for to, to GMSD and a mean and a variance for pi. So my cursor isn't working, but on the side, you see these density plots and they look relatively normal-ish, but they're in fact slightly skewed. To GMSD does not have a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. The mean is actually around negative 1.2 in this species. That's because of those violations of those assumptions but it still has a mean and a variance. And some parts of the genome have different properties from other parts of the genome as you scan across it. The X axis here is the position across the chromosome. And we can see some regions have very high genetic diversity and high to GMSD. Others have very low genetic diversity and low to GMSD. Sometimes we see low genetic diversity, but to GMSD is just normal. So that means that population diversity is probably reduced for other reasons but we can use this data-driven approach to search for signatures of selection. These are the best selective sweeps, they're called, the best signatures of selection in the fruit fly genome. You can see this dip in population genetic diversity, and there's a similar plot for Tajima's D. And this is what they look like. They reduce genetic diversity for part of a region, but then as recombination breaks up the haplotype, breaks up the pieces of the chromosome in the population, you get recombination back onto the normal genetic background. And so it's only the region right next to the mutation that caused your selective sweep, that caused this thing to spread through the population that shows this reduction in diversity. So these are the types of signatures that we look for in population genetics. And population geneticists really like to see these V-shaped plots. We did this same type of analysis in our freshwater mussels. This is a relatively normal part of a of a genome, but you can see there's this region here that shows low genetic diversity. The same region also shows uh, reduced to GMSD. And so we can say that there's probably been some mutation in this gene sequence that was beneficial, that spread through the population quickly, drove out other genetic diversity and caused one of these selective sweeps. So that's cool and interesting. But again, there was something else that popped out of our data that we did not expect. We have some parts of our genome where genetic diversity and to GMSD both flatline. Like they don't just go down low, they go absolutely down to zero. This is more than a megabase, and it's actually close to two megabases of a region that has low genetic diversity and highly skewed site frequency spectra where genetic diversity has been completely wiped out. So it goes really low, which is a signature of outrageously strong selection to get the rest of the genome to act normal and have this section of the genome go low, it's most likely selection. If you violate those other assumptions, if you have a population expansion or population contraction, then you change the average for the genome as a whole. But it's hard to get those demographic events, those changes in population sizes and neutral effects to cause differences that make one part of the genome look different from the other parts of the genome. So this is the most outrageous signature of selection I've ever seen in my life. It looks like you would have to have a lethal mutation that appeared in the population. And if you have that mutation, you live. And if you don't have it, you die. And to get it to go this low, it had to happen extremely recently. That's what we know based on our past results from other organisms. So 
the reviewers for the manuscript, of course, though, want you to not just say it's probably not drift, they want you to prove it. Now there are population genetic simulators like MS Prime and SLIM that you can actually download and play with at home if you wanted to, to simulate how genetic diversity would change under different scenarios. So we can do simulations of population expansion, population contraction, of a sudden bottleneck, you know, a slow expansion or a slow contraction, a sudden bottleneck down to a small number of individuals, a sudden expansion to a large number of individuals. And those things will change your average uh, across the genome, but it won't make one section of the genome look drastically different from the others. And we cannot come up with any type of demographic scenario in our simulations that causes signatures like what we see in the actual data unless we put in natural selection. There are, again, models that are written out on paper for how your genetic diversity, your heterozygosity, should change in a population if you get a population crash. We can even plug in our, our stuff into those models where we say, okay, there's 80 million individuals now. What if you took 80 million individuals and you dropped it down to 100 individuals? We don't think this is likely. We think if that happened, you would have lots of signatures of dead shells you know, these things leave behind evidence. They leave behind shells. They're good for paleontology and archaeology. You could take 80 million individuals down to 100 individuals and keep it there for the past few hundred years. Even if you did, you would be at more than 90% of your heterozygosity. That type of change where you just change the population size and use genetic drift, it, it causes changes to the data very, very slowly. And it's too slow to produce the effects that we observe, even when we come up with ridiculous models. Really, if you took 80 million individuals and took them down to 100, you'd have lots of dead freshwater mussels. And believe me, they reek to high heaven when they're dead. You don't want to go anywhere near them. People would notice you'd have ecological havoc. It would leave signatures behind in terms of like algal blooms that would show up in the sediment. We don't have any evidence for that. But even if it did happen, it's completely ridiculous to say that that scenario could cause the genetic changes that we observe. So these simulators are really, really valuable now. So is it genetic drift? No, we actually did more than 25 different types of simulations of different neutral scenarios and none of them come anywhere close to explaining our data. So because we have the ability to use these models to say what could happen if you imagine a scenario, and none of them fit, then we can stop doing simulations eventually when we get into ridiculous territory and we can say, look, that's just not going to explain what we see. We did other simulations where we add in very, very strong selection and we can fit our parameters with statistics to the data. And the best fit for our model is completely normal um, recombination, normal mutation rates, normal uh, linkage but with a selection coefficient that is so strong that it's basically a lethal trait. That fits with what we know about pesticide resistance. It's made to kill things, right? DDT kills stuff. Don't go play in it, right? So, so with a, basically a lethal trait, even in a short number of generations, then selection can cause sections of the genome to have drastic reductions in the genetic diversity and drastic reductions into GMSD that look just like what we observe in the data. And the best fit for our model is outrageously strong selection, not medium selection, not sort of strong selection, but as strong as you can actually simulate. The, the gene families that we saw from our duplicate gene analysis then pop out of the data when we look at signatures of selection using this population variation. So we have two different measures that say that some of these functions have had strong selection in recent time. One of the only genes in this region that shows the massive reduction in, in genetic diversity is a furin. It's an anticoagulation gene. We think it's important for that larval host, that larval stage that parasitizes the fish hosts. It fits in just like the von Willebrand proteins. It's in the same pathway, just one step up. So that fits with what we know about the biology of the organism. We also see one of these chitin synthase genes, those shell formation genes that we think are so important for this specific species. They have very thick shells. And it's the only gene in this region that could explain the selective sweep. None of the other things in this region have any known function. 
And then another one that's one of our detox genes also shows this outrageous signature of selection with Tajima's D down at negative two, genetic diversity goes down to zero. And again, the only gene in the region is the cytochrome P450 gene. We have other regions in the genome, right, that show signatures of selection, and we don't know exactly why it happened. Either there's too many genes in that region to pin down which function it was, or worse, sometimes we see a signature of selection, and because these are so understudied and they don't have any close relatives that have been sequenced and annotated, we see a gene there, but we don't have a clue what that gene does. So we know that there's something very important to the animal, even if we don't understand it. So this quantitative analysis and population genetics lets you read the genome and find those things that are actually important to the freshwater mussel. And so we can make them talk to us instead of going in with our own preconceived notions and our own candidate genes that we would prefer to look at ourselves. One of the questions that we have is how much of this selection that we see is modern and how much is ancient? You could have ancient selection or, or historic selection that left marks in the genome, and it doesn't have to all be that it happened since 1924, right? So like some of these things could be older cases of selection, some of them could be newer. We don't know. We actually don't know from the genetic data that we have. We can do a pretty good job of distinguishing events that occurred in the past, say, 2,000 years from the ones that occurred in the past 10,000 years, but we don't have a lot more resolution. We can't get it down to two decades like we would like. But we can do some other analysis that might um, get some information. There are actually members of this species that are sitting in a museum in Pittsburgh that were collected in 1924 before the dam was, right, right after the dam was put in and before modern DDT was applied. If you could get DNA out of those shells and if they would give those shells to you, then you might be able to use that historic DNA to help. If we were to get funded, we would probably approach museums and ask them if they would let us try. But there's something else we can do right now to get more information. There are different rivers across the state that are separated from one another. There's what's called the fall line. So this is the foothills of the Appalachians run through the state. And so it's a little more uh, mountainous plateau in the northern part of the state and then the plains to the south. The fall line runs through the state and the rivers above the fall line at Muzzle Shoals at the top of the state, they run north. The rivers below the fall line run south. So we have river systems, two river systems that are completely separate from one another. And then over in the corner next to Georgia and Florida, um, there's another river that runs straight into the Gulf. So we have three different locations that are separated from one another, where if we get population genetic data, we can look at what's different in those populations. If it's modern selection, you should see differences between the, the signatures of selection at Muscle Shoals compared to what's in South Alabama. And there's also differences in pollution across these different re reservoirs. So it's slightly less polluted um, in South Alabama and way less polluted over close to Florida and Georgia because it's in a nat national forest. We have genetic data from the second population on the left-hand side of the state. There are fewer signatures of selection in that population, and most of the population-specific selection comes from muscle shoals, and a lot of it is at those detox genes and those fish-host interaction genes. So that's some of the work that we're trying to do over the summer, so stay tuned to see what actually comes of that. That implies that a lot of the selection at muscle shoals is fairly recent. If it were ancient, it would be in both of those populations before they got separated but because it's population specific, we think it's more likely to be very recent. We're also working on new reference genomes for different species of freshwater mussels. We've got packed bio uh, data that my postdoc in my lab has been collecting. We're trying to put together genome sequences. We have some of the genomes completely assembled and probably annotated um, and others that just came off the sequencer this week. So we're trying to expand this analysis to see how different species differ from one another, especially to see how our endangered species and our smaller populations look different from the species with very large populations. Do I'm they gonna, differ with respect? I'm going to ask a question. Yeah. Yesterday, you did dissections on mussels. All right. So what do you see with what Rebecca's presenting here? All right. 
with what you did. I know this is just the exterior part, but what applications can you do from your dissection yesterday and what you learned with what you see? Say it louder. You can see the umbo. You can see the umbo. All right. Anything else that you can see? Okay, so directions. All right, I think I'm looking for a little bit more on that, but <clears throat> did you see any mosses or anything growing on any of those? Were they all cleaned up? Clean, yeah. So as she's talking about this, think about the internal structures and how that organism filters that food and the complications they're going to have. All right, let's get that interior structure. So put those two pieces together, right? Does that sound okay, Rebecca? Yeah. So okay. actually, this this is a picture of, of one muscle. Um, that the brown pigmented section on the edge of the mantle, right, is part of the siphon that they use to filter in the water. Right. And then the the mantle flaps are on the outermost region. And then moving inside, you see the gills. They actually have um two sets of gills on either side in these species. The One of the gills is swollen in these species on each side um, with a puffy section. That's where they keep their glochidia. You have your muscular foot below that. I wish my cursor would show up on this Zoom. There's something that's been updated, so-called updates. The muscular foot, which is very, very tough. It's hard to cut through that section. Um, um, and then, it, Beneath those gills, the gills are just covering the visceral mass, which is where all the internal or, or organs are. Like um, if you cut that open, there's lots of algae inside. So it filters the, the water through its gills. It collects algae. It takes it down to the stomach, the algae, and it digests them there uh, in, the, in the visceral mass. You can see the adductor muscles. These have these usually have two pairs of adductor muscles. That would be different if you look at marine bi bivalves. And we think marine bivalves look very similar to this, but they're separated by 200 million years from the marine muscles. So that's very, very deep time. Um, and actually, like, there's a debate about how long in the past it happened based on their distribution and, and phylogenies and stuff like that. So some people say 500 million years in the past. Some people say... 200 million years in the past. Apparently, if you ask the wrong people, knives come out because they argue over it. Um, for me, that's too long in the past to, to look at population diversity. Hmm. Wait, you mentioned that um, marine mussels and bivalves are like, like separate in time, but aren't bivalves like mussels and bivalves? I'm kind of confused about it. What was the last part? It was hard to hear. Aren't bivalves mussels? I mean, muscles. <laughs> yeah, muscles are bivalves. There's a there's a huge. So you've got your marine, you've got your marine muscles, your marine scallops, right? Your marine oysters, and then these freshwater muscles are like two hundred to five hundred million years divergent from those. Okay. There's now a marine oyster that's been um, sequenced because of its commercial value, and so we can use some of that information to look at gene functions. Excuse okay, me. Thank you. And fine genes. Yeah. So we think they look pretty alike. And yes, they're bivalves, but they're like their whole own clade. And they're found all over the world. Michelle. Um, uh, I have a question. So um, when you're talking about the certain genes picked from the population, I want to know in the freshwater mussels and other just freshwater species in general, how often do we see selective cleaving occur? And um, in what condition does this occur? And when does it not? Right. So so selective sweeps are common in most organisms with large population sizes. So like in fruit flies, we can search for those, but we see those Vs, those standard selective sweeps, and we see them all over the genome. Um, a lot of times you have rapidly evolving functions like um, anything that's coevolution, so parasite host coevolution, immunity genes, um, male-female interaction genes and mating, those genes change rapidly as well. That's what we would expect to see if we did this on a fruit fly. This freshwater mussel looks different from those. It's got more recent signatures of selection than we see in most, in, in my experience, in most fruit flies. In humans, we see less natural selection, fewer selective sweeps. 
in part because in the past, population sizes were fairly small. And a lot of the adaptation that we observe where there's signatures of selection is um, specific to environments like high altitude adaptation or cold tolerance adaptation as they moved you know, out of Africa. Um, so those are very specific scenarios. I have, I have never seen any other genome that looks like this though, with those huge reductions in diversity. Um, so if you do the, the duplicate gene analysis or the selective sweep analysis, you'll come up with something in most organisms, but this is a little bit weirder. The fact that we can recover things that we know are important for the, the muscles um, with those, the fact that these make sense was kind of a surprise after, you know, a lot of times you do science and you have all your expectations and then you come up with nothing you expected. So. Any other questions? All good. Thank you. Great. We'll take a break at 10, right? Yeah, I've got Alexa is supposed to cut us off at 10. Okay. <laughs> and then come back. All right. Yeah. Otherwise, I'll blab on for an hour. Okay. <laughs> and nobody gets to go to the bathroom. Right. So we have all our different species, and we want to know how our endangered species are evolving differently from our large populations. Right. And so we can look at these different species that are doing great and have even had population expansion. And then we can look at others that have extreme population contraction. And so as we generate new reference genomes, we can now start to do this population genetic analysis um, in other species to see what's different about the population sizes. So when I started this project, I got an email um, from a guy at Georgia named John Wears. I had met him. He was just starting his professor job as I was graduating from college. And so he said, hey, I heard that you're working on these freshwater mussels. That's totally awesome. He said, I have in my freezer DNA from a species called Elliptio spinosa. Do you want it? What? Where are my slides? Right. So Elliptio spinosa is on the IUCN red list of endangered species. It has not been seen alive since 2007, 2008 at all. No individual seen alive at all. It's popular in museums because it has these spikes all over it, right? These really dramatic shells. But they got one individual in 2005 where they extracted a hemolymph sample, so a blood sample from the muscle. They got DNA out of it. And then just by chance, John wanted to do his DNA extraction the easy way, but he didn't have enough money for that. So he had to do it the hard way and he used a phenylchloroform extraction. It turns out that phenylchloroform extractions are better at getting long DNA sequences. So we were able then to do nanopore sequencing and alumina sequencing on this species that has not been seen alive in more than a decade. And we have a reference genome for it sitting in the lab. Fortunately, we also have a reference genome in the lab for one of its close relatives, Elliptio crassidans. And so we can look at what's different in this endangered species compared to the very common species. And recently, I drove over to the North Carolina Museum of Natural History, where they also had some species that had been preserved in ethanol for decades. We were able to get short read sequencing for those. It actually worked way better than I expected. We got read links that were about 100 base pairs and two out of three worked, which believe it or not is an amazing success rate for old historic DNA. And so we've got those sequences just aligned and we're trying to call mutations and we're trying to get more money so that we can do more sequencing on those specific specimens. So now we can do some level of genetic diversity surveys in this species that may in fact be extinct in the wild. And we can compare it to genetic diversity in its relative that has actually succeeded, that is all over the Eastern United States and has very, very large population sizes to see what's different. So that's Alexa stop. So that's data that we just got this past week and I'm really, really excited about it. And one last thing, there are shells in all these museums. If you could get DNA out of the shells, we could do even more to look at population genetic diversity, including over time to see how genetic diversity changed as they were hit by different selective pressures. Do we see the same selective sweeps or did they go extinct too quickly? Did they fail to adapt and we don't see signatures of selection in their genome that help them survive? All right, so we have time for a break and I'll let you stare at all the names of people really quickly who helped with this project and our funders. Okay, so what time do you want them back? Um, 
10 minutes, 15 minutes. Okay. So what do you want? 10, 15. Do that. Get okay. up, stretch, get some fresh air. Yeah. Fine. <laughs> but also when we can go really all the same as we were in high volume just like oh, it was like we did the same thing right now right now and then it's like like how you do the learning lab for your art this year you're doing your like you're doing your like in class here so it's like work I I I mean I mean, I saw, 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 I and I didn't get a chance to ask you guys. I thought, I don't know. I didn't get a chance to ask you guys. I didn't get a chance to ask you guys. I didn't get a chance to ask you guys. I didn't get a chance to well, I'm sure they do. Yeah. I'm sure they do. Yeah. And they can drink water. Yeah, they all have water. And they've got water in the fridge. I put that on anything this morning or snack. Yeah. 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 They should be doing it. Right. Honestly, yeah. yeah. maybe any of them. I don't know what I've asked. You know, yeah. 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 Okay, so I'll go down yeah. and yeah. Okay. And be back. And I'll just stay up here before this all happens. It just seems like a real uh, mean person. Yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> and I hope she has the right one. Yeah. Maybe you should make one or two backups for today. I'll make a backup for her today, but it doesn't take anything but a stack. It's nice to have it like, okay, never mind. Yeah, it's actually not only like a dollar. It's just like you need to go fly quite a bit. Because all that stuff was all here. He came in on purpose when we are not in the right Next time, if he does this, this is not the time. I have no problem. Yeah. Well, I have. Yeah. I have again. Yeah. So get your butt in here. Yeah. Get your butt in here. The first one to get the free. Yeah. Yes. I hope it is perfect. Mm -hmm. Well, I just so she I I all the just have to change yeah. and yeah. down the 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 Yeah. I don't have anything for any the default character. Oh,
This is a battle talk. I've seen a lot of battle talk. I don't know. 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 Two seventy five, but we're trying to be trying to try. And then I have another one. 
Oh, yes. There's no, um, I know, I know. Um, the brain stretches, that one, that one's Yeah, so it's kind of in. Um, uh, so it's like a popper, and it's like a fidget thing, but it's also like a ball that you can like. Um, everyone in this thing. Okay, so try all of those. See what the cost is. Then just come back to take some. Okay. And, uh, the price the pricing is going to be estimated because I I did the quote okay like give her an estimate of what it is okay before yeah i don't know when when i just told them just um get them his ideas because she might not like and don't go through all that getting them out okay okay so put those three on okay all right and let me look at it and we'll send it okay I don't know. I just think so. How many times are you going to be Yeah, it is. That's the only thing. Yeah, it is. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. So, Kathy, do you guys have lots of smoke from those fires? Oh, yes. Is it bad up there? It's starting to get bad. Our pitch yeah. now is at toxic level 165, something like that. Yeah. That's yeah. Not good. Not good. New York looked intense, too. Yeah, my brother's up there, and uh, he said it's terrible. Yeah, I I might leave town if I like. I have asthma bad enough. I would probably leave town. Yeah. Well, and I have a lung problem. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to have any more problems that I have. <laughs> I mean, yeah, if you need to take a trip, I would. Yeah, yeah. Charlotte has air quality. Let me assemble this group. Not... Everybody, take this. Alexa, stop. <laughs> Alexa says it's time to go. So okay, we have to follow, follow her. her. All right, here we go. Thank you. Absolutely. All right. So the next section is going to be relatively short, oh, no. and then we'll we'll go into um. Uh, hopefully some uh, discussions with you guys doing the lead. Oh,
Um, All right. So that was that was that's the work that we're doing on freshwater mussels, where we're trying to do the same type of evolutionary genetic analysis that we've done in other species in the past to understand how they have adapted to changing environments um, and what genomic changes we hope to attack in the future, what genomic changes may be specific to endangered species that would be different from large populations. And there's of course, the, there are these theories for why that should be true, but I want to go through one project that I did when I was a postdoc. We're following up on this now with results from elephants about um, how genomes changed in woolly mammoths as they went extinct. And so this is related to the same premise. Sorry, let me change my little window here. This is related to the same premise as all of our other work that in population genetics that we expect differences in small populations compared to large populations, right? So our nearly neutral threshold should change in small populations compared to large populations. There are more mutations that will be bad, but not bad enough to be weeded out. You have a small gene pool, a small number of individuals. You get fluctuations in allele frequencies based on chance alone. And so mutations that would be weeded out in a very large population can start to accumulate in small populations. It's harder to get adaptation with beneficial mutations spreading. It's also harder to weed out your detrimental variation. So there are mutations that would be outcompeted in a large population that can persist in small populations. They may not necessarily make it to the highest frequencies. They may not be found in every single individual in the population. But if you look across all the individuals in your population, every individual will have more bad mutations than what you see in a large population because of exactly the same population genetic theories, right? So, um, I want to tell you about one project that we did on woolly mammoths and how looking at our different sources of mutations besides the single base pair changes helped us to get more insight about their genomes. All right, so woolly mammoths were some of the um, more prevalent large herbivores during the Pleistocene and early Holocene, so from about 100,000 years ago to around 10,000 years ago. And they lived out on the open plains and they foraged and they ate grasses and they define the landscape around them, um, especially on the Siberian steppe and in different parts of North America from Alaska down to Michigan. So woolly mammoths were grazers. They had these flat teeth with plate-like grooves to grind up different grasses. Um, and, and they reshaped their environment much like the bison did in the, in the American plains, if you know about those stories. So they eat the grasses, they keep trees from growing up, and then their dung uh, fertilizes the grasses again, and you get this rich environment in part because of these large herbivores. But eventually the climate started to warm and trees started to grow up over the open plains. And so parts of their habitat that previously had been suitable for them when environments were colder became less suitable. Woolly mammoths could not eat twigs uh, from trees and bushes like mastodons could, and so it was very limited habitat that actually remained grasslands as the climate warmed. Excuse me, coffee. There was another thing that happened that was not so good for the woolly mammoths, and that's that humans started to show up in Europe, including in Siberia. And so they used the woolly mammoths as a food source. They were fairly large. If you could kill a mammoth, then you have plenty of meat to eat. Um, and there are points in history where we think that humans had arrived in Europe and in Asia, but there's no direct archaeological evidence of that, except that there are spear marks on the cheekbones of woolly mammoths. One of the ways to take down an elephant or a mammoth very quickly is to target the artery that feeds the trunk. We all have um, uh, blood vessels that supply our nose, but our nose is relatively small, so those blood vessels are, are not, not major arteries. In elephants, one of the changes in the evolution of the trunk, there's all these muscular changes that had to happen to give them a trunk that they could actually move around in different ways, like our arms. But one of the other changes that had to happen is that there's a blood vessel that runs across the cheek and feeds the nose. 
And that got enlarged to produce a very, a very large artery. And if you can hit that artery on the side of a cheek, then it's one of the few ways to take down an elephant very quickly because they bleed out. So this reduces the likelihood that someone in the hunting party gets hurt because an elephant is wounded but not felled. And it also guarantees that you get something to eat that way. So as opposed to if you hit an elephant in other parts, um, if you if you tried to shoot at an elephant and you go with what you think is the brain, it's probably not the brain. The brain is actually further back behind the eye. So like if you if you miss, then it's very likely that someone is going to be trampled and that your woolly mammoth gets away. So they can find spear marks on the cheekbones of woolly mammoths long before they can find direct evidence of human presence. And other types of predators don't have the same effects. And there's not the same widespread damage to the bones elsewhere, right? So this is an indirect measure of human presence. So this combination of climate change and human presence ended up eventually resulting in the mammoth's demise. And so we, of course, know that they went extinct. But when I was a kid, I read about how there were explorers who went out to the Arctic and they found woolly mammoths that were still found frozen in the ice with skin on the bones and fur still on the skin. So even though these mammoths died so long before, thousands of years ago, and no one alive has seen what they look like in, in the actual wild, that you still knew a lot about what they looked like, where they were from. The mammoth bones are relatively large, so they're easy to find. If you go out in Siberia, there were people, it's legal to sell mammoth ivory. It is not legal to sell um, elephant ivory. So people will go out and try to find tusks in Siberia. And some people use that as a subsistence living where they sell the, the mammoth tusks for ivory. And that's how they, that's how they earn their living. In La Brea in LA, if you go there, there's also the tar pits, right, where the woolly mammoths got trapped in the tar. And they have hundreds of skeletons from individuals, so whole skeletons from multiple individuals for Colombian mammoths. And so even though the species died out so long ago, we still know what they look like, we know what they ate. You can find the stomach contents in some of the mammoths that are found frozen in the ice. And we even know about population variation from all of the fossils that have been collected. And so when I was a kid, this seemed like the closest you could get to having a time machine, that even though these things were gone, we could still see so much about them. So I went home in kindergarten and I told my parents that I wanted to be a woolly mammoth explorer. And then I pulled out all the National Geographics about woolly mammoths and read them all. And then, you know, I told my dad and my dad said, we need to have a talk about how to get a real job when we grow up and support ourselves and being a mammoth explorer isn't actually a real job, so we have to go on to other things. So I made my parents proud by becoming an evolutionary geneticist, and then later in life met a bunch of woolly mammoth explorers who actually do earn their living that way. Don't let your parents crush your dreams. All right. So I really became an, an evolutionary geneticist because I was interested in these concepts of how you get brand new genes and more abstract questions about how evolution operates. But when I was a postdoc in Monty Slotkin's lab, there was a paper that was published from Ella Pacopolo and Lova Dahlin at the Swedish Museum of Natural History, where they published high coverage genome sequences with short read genetic data uh, for two different woolly mammoth specimens. And the amount of sequence data that they got was almost equivalent to what you would get from fresh DNA. The quality of that was a little more difficult to manage, but they had very high coverage genomes. One of these genomes came from a, a juvenile individual that was found at a location called Oimikon mm -hmm. from 44,000 years ago. And the other was a tooth that came from a specimen that was found on Wrangell Island off the north coast of Siberia. Wrangell Island was one of the last refuges of mammoths. So after they all died out on the mainland sometime between, you know, around 12,000 years ago, maybe 10,000 if you really want to argue about it. There were still isolated populations on islands off the coast of Siberia and Alaska where they persisted. Wrangell Island was the last place that woolly mammoths were alive, and they persisted until around 3,700 years ago. So this island is actually a bleak and desolate place. Um, it is very, very cold. It is north of Siberia, north of Alaska. It has some scrubby grassland and shrubs 
And there are very few animals that actually make it to this island. And it's far isolated, out of the reach of humans. And coincidentally, around the time humans finally got to this island, around 3,700 years ago, is right around the time that they ended up going extinct. We don't have direct evidence that they hunted them to death. Um, there could be other things like bringing diseases or just frightening the population so they stampede off the side of a cliff. But whatever happened, the population was gone by 3,700 years ago. So this island is covered with scrubby weeds and a little bit of grassland, and it's very, very cold. So it remained more suitable habitat for the mammoths after climate change had changed a lot of the mainland. It was so isolated that it kept them far away from humans that hunted them. And so they had this place that was very cold and perhaps uh, what seems to us like a terrible climate. The island is often hit with high Arctic cyclones, like these Arctic hurricanes that hit the island and they will decimate all of the vegetation on the island. This may not sound so great, but it's one of the reasons why the mammoths could persist on this island because the winds would blow over trees and stop them from growing up on the island. So it remained a small patch of grassland and a bunch of scrubby weeds without those trees that were unsuitable habitat for them. And also because it's cold and isolated and dangerous to get to, it was harder for humans to get there. So they persisted on this island until 3,700 years ago. And to put this into historical context, at this point in time, the pyramids have been put up in Egypt. Ur of the Chaldeans has risen and fallen. They put up Stonehenge in England, and these mammoths are just hanging out. Meanwhile, maize has been domesticated in the Americas as a food source, and horses were domesticated in the Arabian Peninsula. But for some reason, and we don't quite know why, no one ever domesticated a woolly mammoth, which is sad. So Wrangell Island was this last refuge. Um, and one of the questions we often get is how did the woolly mammoths actually make it to this island? Well, we don't totally know, but there's some information that we do have from the paleontology. So you can look at the isotopic ratios of, of strontium to calcium in these woolly mammoth bones. And at around 14,000 years ago, those isotopic ratios are different on the island because of the, the geological formations and the fauna and the flora compared to what's present on the mainland. And you can use these isotope ratios to show that their bones are consistent with them foraging on the mainland during their lifetime, even if they were found dead on the island, which suggests that they could go back and forth. And at this time, we know that there were ice sheets connecting the island to the mainland. The ocean levels were lower, there were more glaciers. And so they can move back and forth from the island to the mainland, both in terms of geology, geography, and in terms of what we can get from the isotopic ratios in their bones. By around 12,000 years ago, the bones start to show that they spent their entire lives on the island. And we know at this point, the ice sheets had melted completely. The channel was too wide for them to swim across and they were completely separated. What happened in between 14,000 to 12,000 years ago is a subject of fierce debate. Um, and there's some debate about whether or not they could only cross over during the winter instead of during the summer. There's also a debate about whether there were like decades here and there where it got a little bit colder again and so they could cross. But we know that by 12,000 years ago, they were completely separated. There's also a debate about how far the woolly mammoths could have could swim in Arctic waters. We know with modern day elephants that they can swim up to 50 miles a day, so 100 kilometers a day. And any island that is within about 100 miles of shore, 200 and something kilometers from shore, that the elephants are really good at invading those islands. Elephants are buoyant. So if they, if they get tired, they are not going to sink. They have a natural built-in snorkel. They just hold their trunk up over the water. They love to swim. They have lots of endurance, much better than a human. And so they have this biology that makes them very good at invading different islands, far better than humans even. Occasionally, you'll see these news stories that like an elephant went to swim off the coast of India or Sri Lanka, and they towed it back to shore and they rescued it. Really, they weren't rescuing the elephant from drowning at all. That elephant was probably just fine. But if it got hit by a boat, that would be bad for it, right? So they tow them back into shore. So there's been repeated island invasion by elephants and mammoths all across the globe. So there's Wrangell Island and also St. Paul's Island that were the last refuge of, of mammoths. 
there were dwarf stegodons, dwarf elephant-like things, on the island of Flores, where they also found the petite humans that they've nicknamed hobbits, Homo florensis. There were also woolly mammoths on the Channel Islands, and in Crete, there's some debate. Uh, uh, well, they they had uh, a different type of Mediterranean mammoth that may or may not have been a separate species. In every case of island invasion, the elephantids get smaller. So you get these dwarf mammoths and elephants in these different islands. On the Channel Islands, they were about six feet tall. On Crete, they were about four feet tall. And some people think that the legend of the Cyclops is actually these petite mammoth skulls that were found because the place where the trunk is has one large hole for the trunk that looks like one gigantic eye. So then there was this legend of giants that had lived there that had only one eye, which is probably these different mammoths, Mammothus meridionalis. On Wrangell Island and St. Paul's Island, they were short for a mammoth. They were about 10 feet tall to 12 feet tall at the tallest male, which is different from uh, about 14 feet for, uh, for your standard woolly mammoth on the mainland. We know that in modern populations, short elephants will get beat up, no joke. So there are, there are petite elephants, not quite true dwarf elephants, that will sometimes appear in populations, especially in Asian elephants, that will be about 10 feet tall. And when they appear, the males especially will get run out of the herd and beat up. There are shorter elephants that are found in Borneo, Asian elephants. There's one in a zoo. She's actually uh, not quite as smart as the other elephants, and she's also shorter. They beat her up so much, they had to put her separate from the other elephants. So they keep her separately. They have a handler who interacts with her, and you can see pictures where they take her through the zoo at night to see the other animals, and she really loves the penguins. It's kind of cute. All right, so when you get small, isolated populations, when everything else on the mainland had gone extinct, that's a massive change in population size, and they persisted for thousands of generations. We know that genetic diversity depends on the effect of population size. And even within a single genome, there are different sections of the genome where the ancestry meets in the past at different times that show different effective population sizes. You can use the genetic diversity across the genome to infer the population sizes in the past using a program called PSMC. So, when we run this program on the two different mammoths, the oimicone mammoth comes from a time when mammoths were happy and healthy around 40,000 years ago when they were out foraging on the open plains. At this point, the effective population size is fairly large. It's someplace around 15,000 individuals, which is very high for a large herbivore. Usually we would see lower. In the Wrangell Island mammoth, you can see the genetic diversity drop and drop and drop over time. And we, of course, know that this poor mammoth, the population is doomed, and so their demise is actually written in their DNA. Again, if you can do bioinformatics and genomics and enough population genetic modeling, you can read the genetic stories that are written in these genomes. So we see a different story in the Wrangell Island mammoth compared to the Oimicone mammoth in terms of the past population sizes. And that was the result that they published in this paper from Pacopolo and Lobodalum. The first day that they released the data, I pressed download. In population genetics and, and genomics and biomedical genetics, you're required to share your data so that other people can validate your results and so that other people can build on those results too. This is a great scenario to look at the nearly neutral models of evolution. And there's a lot of literature, especially from this guy named Mike Lynch, who has a whole textbook about how effective population sizes and this nearly neutral theory where the nearly neutral threshold changes and detrimental variation can start to accumulate might be affecting our types of mutations that are associated with genetic novelty. So here we have two genomes with a drastic change in effective population size in a fairly short time period. A lot of the previous analysis about nearly neutral theory, especially for these genome structure mutations, we compare things like bacteria to yeast to humans, to fruit flies, and it would say that a lot of the differences were likely to be because of effective population sizes. But there's lots of other variables in play between those things. We don't look a lot like a bacterium, right? So there could be other factors in play. Here we have, for I, we think the first time within a single species, a snapshot before and after a big change in effective population size. 
So we can look at the spectrum of mutations in these two different genomes and see how things are different when you have small population sizes. So that makes it sound like we did all this on purpose. Really, we didn't. I just wanted to work on woolly mammoths, so I downloaded the data and I crunched it. And then this is the story that popped out of the DNA. And again, we found that story because we could do hardcore bioinformatics and population genetics that these other people who work on woolly mammoths, they are fantastic paleontologists, but they don't do bioinformatics the same way. So we could extract more information from these genomes because of that type of not modeling and analysis. When we did the analysis, all the different types of mutations tell us the same thing, that bad things were happening to this woolly mammoth from Wrangell Island. So this woolly mammoth has an excess of deletions. So he has more deletions in his genome than the other mammoth, and he has a higher proportion of deletions that affect gene sequences and break them. He has a greater number of retrogenes, which is probably due to higher transposable element activity, which is sort of like having more virus activity. It's not good for the organism. In some unpublished data, I have some evidence that there were L1 retrotransposable elements that reactivated in the island mammoth compared to the mainland mammoth. There's also an excess of premature stop codons. And in all, the Wrangell Island mammoth has 50% more of his genes broken than the Oymukoan mammoth. So I found this in the DNA and I went to my advisor and I said, look, Monty, it's Mike Lynch's work, right? Like, so this is the theory Mike Lynch has that bad mutations accumulate in small populations, especially for things that change larger sections of DNA at once. And I said, so now what? You could have one mammoth will always ha have more mutations than the other mammoth because one of the two has to. But this was a really extreme effect. And the other thing that we saw was that every type of mutation that we looked at was telling us the same thing. And if you've ever done science, sometimes it disappoints our expectations or it comes out less clear or we see unexpected things. So this was a case where every single way we look at the data, we get the same answer. Bad things are going on. So I was working with Monty Slatkin, who had spent his career doing population genetic theory while I did data analysis. Okay. So, questions? Do we have a question, Kathy? Okay. Or just I'm also looking at the like multi dimension thing. I don't know. I'm trying to stay in the range. But I want to be fun. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, no. Oh, yeah. And then yeah. All right, so you can give a yell if you have a, a question to share. You don't have any questions, sorry. Okay, lots of discussion. Yeah. Which is a good thing. Yeah. All right, so what do you do if you only have two mammoths? That's not really the sample size that we hope for, but it's the sample size that we have, right? And so I like to joke that we have twice the sample size of our physicist friends who study the multiverse. They've only got one universe to look at. We've at least got two mammoths, right? Similar principle. We can use population genetic theory to say what you would expect in a population. We have two mammoths and we have measures of genetic diversity in those two mammoths. We can say, what would the variation be in the natural population that produces a mammoth with this level of genetic diversity? And we get that from looking at the silent sites, the synonymous sites 
that are heterozygous in the genome, that that should also be roughly equal to our pairwise sequence diversity that we would get in a population. If you use theory to put boundaries on what the variance would be, we know what our answer is. What is the maximum range of the variance in a natural population? Your Wrangell Island mammoth is 28 standard deviations below the Oymikon mammoth. That means it is just flat out not possible that these two mammoths could come from similar populations operating under similar evolutionary dynamics. They are too freaking weird on this island to be from any kind of population that's similar to what was present on the mainland further in the past. Not, the, not matching the specific mutations, but just the level of genetic diversity, right? So this says it's not possible. So then we have some questions. We then look at the ratio of non-synonymous substitutions to synonymous substitutions. Because your genetic code is redundant, you can frequently change the third base pair in a codon without changing the amino acid that it codes for. So these mutations are thought to be mm -hmm. mostly neutral. There's still some selection on them, but you know they're the best guess we have for the neutral proxy. How much would you see if you just had neutrality? Then you can look at the amino acid changing substitutions that do change the protein, and those are under constraint. You cannot mutate every protein at will and still have the same functional effects. Some of the amino acid changes modify the function just a little. Some of them modify it by a lot. This ratio is a measure of what's called selective constraint. And one of the factors that influences the number you get out is how strong is selection against bad mutations. If there is less selection against bad mutations, then this number goes up because you get more amino acid changes accumulating in your population because they're kind of bad, but they're not bad enough to be weeded out. The Wrangell Island mammoth has the higher ratio of non-synonymous substitutions to synonymous substitutions. And this may not look big to you, but in population genetic terms, if you go and you model it, it is a massive effect, huge, huge effect. So then we have questions. Was this the lack of selective constraint or are there other factors, right? So we know that these two things are too different to come from the same population, but which of those assumptions from our coalescent models is violated? So we can start doing simulations to see what we would get in a natural population when we change the selective constraint, the population size, we can induce population expansion, contraction, bottlenecks, and all of that. One of the popular hypotheses is that it's a bottleneck. Maybe you just got a small subset of mammoths that moved from the mainland to the island, and you just happened to pick the weirdest mammoth that was present on the mainland. So then you get changes in allele frequencies that are a little bit bigger than what you would actually see, and it's just because you picked the funkiest ones by chance. It is totally possible that a bottleneck happened. In fact, it probably did. But even if it did, it is not sufficient to produce the results that we see in these genomes. That's because a bottleneck can pull from the tail of the existing distribution that you have right now. It cannot invent something that is weirder than the weirdest individual on the mainland. And if you think that bottlenecks can do that, you should never be doing statistics because that would suggest that a finite sample taken from a larger population is not representative. We know that as long as you get about 12 individuals in your population that you approach the normal distribution, right? And so that means even if I have a million individuals out there, I can pick about 12 to 20 and I can come up with a pretty good idea of the variation that's out there. The same thing is happening here. Even though we only have one mammoth, he has a large genome that's broken up by recombination, several different chromosomes, and we have a big enough sample size across the whole genome to say that he's too weird. So a bottleneck can't make something this weird. We can even simulate if you do 10 to the 12th woolly mammoths and take it down to 10 to the second woolly mammoth, so 100, what would happen? And you still don't get effects anywhere close to what we observe in our actual data. At 10 to the 12th woolly mammoths, if you stick them a, a, a tusk to tail, that they would stretch all the way past Jupiter, halfway to Saturn, 
all of the Earth's biomass would be in nothing but mammoths. So you would take every tree, every bacterium, every moss, every plant, every fruit fly, and turn it into mammoths with nothing for them to eat. And you would still not produce the results that we have by bottlenecking it down to 100 individuals. If you take it down to one, you would lose so much of the rest of the genetic diversity, it wouldn't look like what we observe from the island. At this point, this is a completely ludicrous scenario. So we can stop doing simulations and we can say we can find no bottleneck situation that will produce the results that we observe in the data. We simulate selection. If you have, so you have selection against certain types of mutations and you change the population size and we put in the exact population sizes that we infer from the genome. And then we start to get a match for what we observe. And these results are completely consistent with the nearly neutral theory that there are bad mutations that don't get weeded out in small populations. And so that's part of why their genomes were starting to decay. So this is really important, not just for the woolly mammoths, they're already gone, but for conservation genetics. Theory predicts any time you have a small population size that you should start to accumulate genetic effects. The good news is that these effects are time dependent. The more time they spend at small populations before they recover, the worse the genetic decay is. If you can intervene very quickly and bring them back to normal levels, then you will have fewer effects in the genome. Once you do bring them back to normal le levels though, they still bear the hallmarks of small population sizes. And it takes hundreds, thousands, millions of years, depending on the species and the generation time and how bad the genetic decay was in order for them to recover. That's for the single base pair changes. If you delete a section of DNA, getting it back is virtually impossible. And so those are even more difficult to fix than your single base pair changes. So what genes were affected? Well, when we look at this mammoth's DNA, we see lots of bad stuff. We see one mutation that probably made him partially sterile if it does the same thing it does in other mammals, that it reduces sperm formation and he's heterozygous for that mutation, which would make him partially sterile, not fully sterile. Um, he has mutations that probably made a fourth of his offspring drop dead if, um, if he mated with another individual that had the same recessive mutation. He's got another one that probably made him predisposed to lymphedema, which is for your legs swell up, but also probably gave him really beautiful eyelashes. It's the Elizabeth Taylor mutation. Um, <laughs> I'm not joking. She probably had this. So you can look at people, and, and I may have this too. Um, if you have multiple hairs coming out of your follicles, then, then at the eyelashes, that produces a really dynamic effect. And sometimes they have eyelashes that spread a little farther than they should, sometimes even towards the inner eyelids, which irritate their eyes. But it makes the eyelashes extremely thick compared to what you get in other people. Um, and, and you can see it in other hairs on the body. But the same mutation has different effects in other situations and makes people predisposed, either because there's a nearby mutation or because the same gene does multiple things, makes them predisposed to lymphedema. But there's one class of mutations that was more common than you would expect by chance. Not just a one-off mutation where one gene is affected and it looks bad, but lots of bad things are happening to one type of gene. And that's at the olfactory receptors and nasal receptors, the things that contribute to chemosensory effects, so taste and smell. There are several reasons for why these might have shown up in excess of what we would expect based on the regular rates of, of genes being damaged. One possibility is that there were different food sources on this island. It's got a lot of scrubby weeds as well as the grassland. And so non-preferred food sources were present and they may have had to eat those in order to survive. So there could be selection against being able to sense certain noxious, noxious chemicals, like you know the kid refusing to eat their green beans. If you can't sense whatever is funky in green beans, then you might eat them. And this is a common thing that happens in island environments when you get a shift in habitat whether it's mice or fruit flies, or in this case, the mammoths. It's also possible that they didn't have the same predators on the island, so they didn't have to smell them coming. It's totally okay if you can't smell a saber-toothed cat coming at you because there are none on this island. It's a lot safer. And it may also be one of the reasons why they got a little bit smaller. They didn't have to defend from predators. It's also possible that you can just knock out an olfactory receptor and the mammoth doesn't drop dead. 
So maybe they were beneath the nearly neutral threshold on this island, right? Like if I can't smell cilantro, I can, but if I can't smell cilantro, then like that's not going to kill me. So maybe I'll limp along and survive on this island where that mutation might have been weeded out on the mainland. But there's this other class of, of proteins that was also affected a lot, and that's the major urinary proteins. You know how your dog likes to pee in certain spots? That's because the urinary proteins have social signals in them. And there's a guy at Utah who did his thesis work on urinary proteins in elephants and how important they are for social interactions. They have a big influence on social dominance hierarchies, who's in charge and who do you defer to and who's running the herd. These are changing in concert with, you know, at the same time as the, the, the genes that actually pick up on those urinary proteins. So we have our sense of smell and we have the urinary proteins changing at the same time. So whether this was adaptive or neutral or a lack of constraint or whatever it was, these things were changing together. And they probably had some sort of effect on the mammoth behavior and biology, the exact nature of which we don't really know. And then there's one mutation that was more fun than the others, and that's at the locus of FOXQ1. FOXQ1 is a transcription factor, and one of the places where it functions is in the inner core of hairs during hair formation. One of the copies, one of the copies of this gene on one chromosome was deleted completely, so it no longer exists. The other copy has a frame shift mutation that knocks out the function of this gene. So there are two different ways that this gene has been non-functionalized in this woolly mammoth, but, but now that gene doesn't function. If you get mutations in FOXQ1, the tough inner core of hairs does not form. And we think that this was a really important adaptation for mammoths, that their fur was thicker, especially in the outer guard hairs. The same gene also functions in renewing, it, it occurs in rapidly proliferating cells, right? So your hair formation, those cells proliferate rapidly, and that's one of the reasons why they're affected by chemotherapy treatments. Also, the cells in the stomach, as they get eroded by stomach ac acid, also proliferate rapidly. So satin fur mutants that don't have the inner core of their hairs oftentimes also have gastric effects where they have to be spe fed special diets, otherwise they get sick. This mutation is really popular among uh, domesticated animals that are kept as pets. So the fur will be the same color it always was. The melanin deposition works the same way, but the furs lack that inner core. So they're kind of translucent and shiny. So if you ever see furs, like actual furs from rabbits and stuff in, um, in stores, or if you see these pets that are kept as satin fur mutants that are found in guinea pigs and, and mice, then they are kind of shiny and translucent in the life, light and they have soft, silky fur. So this poor little mammoth was so messed up. He has all these bad mutations hanging out in his genome, but he was also a satin fur mutant. So he was probably really, really shiny and really, really ridiculously good looking in spite of all of his genetic effects. So now my lab is getting genetic data for different Asian elephants, which are threatened and endangered in the wild. They've had a longer population decline, but it's not quite as extreme. <clears throat> so Gabe O'Reilly, the same postdoc in my lab, who's been trying to help work with the new reference genomes for bivalves, he's also working on the genetic data for Asian elephants to try to see how their genomes may have changed over time as well. Is it as bad as what we see in the mammoth or is it not as bad? Is there a threshold beyond which you get really, really bad things happening in the genome? and genomic meltdown, um, or are these elephants kind of okay? We've already seen some hints of selfish genes activating in the Asian elephants, and especially uh, transposable elements that were thought to be inactive. So it's sort of like having a virus reactivate in your genome over time, and that's totally consistent with the theories of nearly neutral evolution. All right, so these are all the people to thank, and that's the story of the mammoths, and I am more than happy to take questions. I have a question. Yes. So you just recently mentioned about there's like a threshold past the point of no return where conservation won't really help. How do we or how do conservation genomic um, or geneticists detect this threshold or calculate this threshold based on like the um like the like effective population size and all the different factors? Great question. The truth is 
there's some theory that people can speculate about, but it really, I think, needs empirical approaches, especially if you want to study not the single base pair changes that are so easy to model, but our mutations that that change large chunks of DNA at once. And so one of the first pages of my grant when I submit it on the elephants, I've got to revise it this summer, but one of the first pages of my grant says exactly that, that we need empirical data on these endangered species to see what's happening because it's possible that these transposable elements can wreak havoc very, very quickly. We know they can modify genomes quickly and work from plants and fruit flies and stuff. And so um, with single base pair changes, it takes a lot more time and the models fit better. Um, there are some people who look at genetic disease risk in humans as well with a, a theoretical modeling uh, perspective and also with empirical data where they, they use both hand in hand. Um, but as we get more genetic data sets from these animals that previously were harder to sequence, we can start to address those questions. There are a few people who try to model how many individuals you would need for like a space colony before it goes extinct. And most of those models suggest that below about 300 individuals, you start to get really big problems. Other question, Sean or Alan. Um, so I have a question for like interpretation of argument D. So like, yeah. If, it, if, it is, if it's like uh, lower than zero or if Hodgman's D is lower than zero, then like what does that mean for the amount of rare or rare alleles? Uh, right. Let me pull up. So the, the theory, if you meet all your assumptions, oh, and one assumption I forgot to mention is non-overlapping generations, but really that's a soft assumption um, unless you're working with like plants that have seeds that last 100 years. Where's my slide? I do have slide, there we go. I'm gonna pull up my fruit fly slide because it's the most well-informed. Here. Right, so this is this is what we observe in fruit flies. Tajima's D is negative 1.1. That means that there are more rare alleles and fewer moderate frequency alleles than we would expect based on the standard model. A lot of that can be produced with population expansion. You get a, a, a regular population and you make it even bigger. Now you've got more individuals to collect mutations and they haven't had enough time to reach equilibrium where some of those rare mutations will move towards moderate frequency and some of those rare mutations will be weeded out. If you run it to equilibrium, it should go back to zero, but there's no population that's actually in equilibrium. So this is an excess of rare alleles. A positive to genus D means you have more moderate frequency alleles than you expected based on chance. That's more common with population contraction. All right, thank you. Other questions? Sophie? Do you have a question? I'm scratching your head, okay. <laughs> Rebecca, do you want to share a little bit about your career with them? Yeah, sure. I find it sure. fascinating. Okay. Yeah, so, um, <laughs> so you know, I, I grew up in Florence, Alabama for a lot of, you know, I was a nerd coming out of the box, right? Like by three-year-olds, one of my favorite books had like the science of electricity in it, right? And uh, probably like a lot of people in the room. Um, but I, I grew up in Alabama um, and went to a, a relatively good public school, but not quite like some of the... Um, you know, there are some schools that really set up the students for success worldwide. Um, so we had decent educational opportunities and stuff. But I thought I, I was more interested in things like chemistry and physics, especially physics or astrophysics for quite quite a long time when I was a kid. And um, But then when I was in high school, you could finally get genome sequences for individuals and PCR had made it possible to work with genetic data. And after taking AP Biology, I was really interested in how genes worked and how cellular machines work. And my career has really tracked the sequencing technology. So some of the first genomes were released when I was in high school and in college for model organisms like fruit flies and humans. Um, they become, became better annotated and fixed by the time I was in graduate school. And so the fact that you could work with genetic data and population genetic data um, really facilitated my career where I was interested in how you get evolutionary change. Those questions were finally possible to answer when I started graduate school. 
And then it became possible to get large scale population genetic data sets. And those actually came online right as I was finishing my PhD. I chose my postdoc to move to a lab that had non-model fruit fly populations data sets. And that was just like a huge breakthrough at the time in sequencing. And then as sequencing got better and better, you could work first on ancient DNA. One of the reasons I joined that lab, they had genetic data for Neanderthals. So I published a paper on Neanderthals. They got their funding because they were working on Neanderthals and humans. You couldn't get that much money to do that high risk work. That Swedish Museum of Natural History, they do paleontology and it costs them $50,000 to $100,000 every summer that they go to that island. They get flown over on military helicopters and then they work with dozens of bones. So they tried like, they may have tried a hundred bones to see which ones had DNA in them and two of them worked in order to float the cost of the failures to do that high risk, high reward work You've got to have lots of funding. Now genome sequencing is getting so much cheaper that a single lab can make new reference genomes. So that's why we've been able to do our work on freshwater mussels right now when that would not have been possible even five years before. So my collaborator makes fun of me because I say there's been a breakthrough in sequencing. He's like, doesn't that happen every six months? I'm like, yeah, basically. So, um, so now that we can sequence any organism, we can do that evolutionary genetics in any animal we choose. And we can, it's not just about the animals, it's that we can answer questions that we could not answer before. All the model systems like fruit flies have big population sizes. Humans also have relatively big population sizes. It's only just now that we can start to work on endangered species and that's a really active area of research in the field. Anastasia always says we. What's the we mean? What, we, me and my lab, me yeah. and the whole field, right. me and my advisors, yeah. yeah. The collaboration is just amazing. Oh yeah, we could not do our work without Jeff Garner because like I I technically got scuba certified once upon a time. I can maybe tell a washboard muscle apart from a heel splitter, but like he is the world's expert. He does the scuba diving. He does the surveys from the state. And if he weren't sending us the muscles, we could not do that work without him. And how do you make your connections? We go to conferences every year. So usually I go to a couple of conferences a year. So either the fruit fly meeting for some of our work, evolution, which is coming up soon in Albuquerque, um, and then the Society for Molecular Biology and Evolution, and then there's another European meeting that I'll probably go to next year. So we go and we give talks on our work. It's, a, it's actually a lot, I don't know how many of you have been to ICEF or will go to ICEF, but it's a lot like the International Science Fair. Um, you go and you present your work to other people, you talk to other nerds, you hang out, you have fun, um, but that's where we build our connections. So last time I went to a conference, I came home with three collaborations and I have data sitting on my servers right now that I desperately need to crunch so that I don't disappoint them um, and so that we can present it at other conferences soon. Excellent. Sophie had a question for you. Oh yeah, you mentioned that population contraction is associated with the um, positive cognitive disease. Yes. And if you could like, explain how that works. So if you have a population contraction, you take a subset of individuals uh, from the bigger population. So your, your natural population has lots of, it has lots of rare things, a few common things, and then some moderate frequency alleles in the middle. If you do a population contraction, you probably are missing a lot of the things that are found only in one individual. So you lose a lot of the low frequency variation just by making the population smaller. And then the things that looked like they were at moderate frequency will become slightly more moderate frequency. And some of the things at high frequency also may not be captured and they'll look more moderate than they're supposed to. Really, a lot of the population expansion and population contraction, if it happened yesterday, you probably won't see it because you've got a finite sample. You need more time for new mutations to start to accumulate in your population in order to see some of the effects um, of these different types of mutations and see big effects on CGMSD. It takes a good bit of time. There's a whole lot of population genetic theory, but there's also simulators that you can download. One is called SLIM and the other one is called MS Prime. And even I think on a single laptop, you could simulate a lot of scenarios in evolution and start to answer some theoretical questions doing that. I mean, there's lots of other people who do math and theory on pencil and paper, but the simulators make it much easier to do that 
that inference and to model different scenarios based on what you see in your data. Any other questions? Okay, one parting word of wisdom for each of them. <laughs> oh, goodness. Then I'll let you go. Um, so I would say if you have a, a scientific question that you are genuinely interested in, that enthusiasm goes a long way to, to getting opportunities. Like, you know, if someone walks up to me in a conference and says they also like freshwater mussels, then it's like, oh, there's one other nerd that likes this in the world, right? So uh, they will be happy to talk to you. And if they have any way for you to join their lab, then that will work. So if you can find a match between the person running a lab and your own interests, then, then that's the place you want to go. Don't chase the buzzwords or something like, there's lots of people who want to do genomics on COVID these days. That's very important. Um, and there are some people who are genuinely interested in that and have a skill set where they can offer something to make new insights there. But studying that just because it made the news is less creative and you'll have more fun if you do what you want to do and latch on to whatever scientific questions that you want. Or if you don't want to do science, that's okay too, right? Like my brother-in-law worked in a science lab for one semester. He hated it so much, he switched his major to philosophy and he became a very well-paid lawyer. That's great. My sister's also an artist. She would rather die than do my job. And I think the reciprocal is true. So like, go do what you want to do because life's too short. And anything that you're passionate about, you can make a find a way to make a living at it. And that's one of the ways to be a little bit happier. Excellent. Well, thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you.